Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truin. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we talk about how to handle some reoccurring cracks in a drywall ceiling. There are several different ways to attack that particular problem. When do you hire a contractor on a renovation project? It has a lot to do with asking yourself just how much time and effort do you have to spend on the project because be surprised how much time it takes in order to choose everything, but we'll give you a few tips to think about on that. A hard to open refrigerator doors or anything that can be done about it, well, this time of the year, a lot of people are encouraging a hard to open refrigerator door, but it can be aggravating throughout the year. We have a few little tricks that can make that a little easier. Also, Joe, what about that simple solution? All right, Danny, now the holidays are over. I think a lot of people spent their time in the kitchen cooking, and I have a quick tip on how to steam clean your microwave oven. All right, a lot to deal with here, a lot to share with you, so let's get started. Right now, we're going to Virginia, and Alan is on the line. Alan, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house there. Well, hello, Danny. Hello, Jojo. I hope you guys are doing well. Doing great. Thank you. Hey, we realize that you're talking to not the sharpest tool in the shed here. Uh, As I sent you these pictures, I've had this recurring fracture on a wall, and you would think after three times of patching it, I would have figured out something different. Uh, (laughs) So the the ultimate question is to tape or not to tape. Is is that the question? Well, that sounds like the question. What's the answer? That's what we have to figure (laughs) out. Well, you know, Alan, one of the big, big trends, and still to a degree, are the specialty ceilings in homes, the, you know, bump-up ceiling, pocket ceilings, particularly the turtleback ceilings, which um, look pretty nice, but boy, they're notorious for cracking in those corners. A lot of times, um, the framers are nailing these things together when really in those critical areas actually should be screwed together because it does have um, a tendency to have a lot of movement right in there. But in, in your case here, I would definitely use tape. And I and I pose that question to a very experienced drywall finisher that I know about whether to use fiberglass tape or whether to use paper tape. I would have easily thought that the fiberglass tape would be a little more flexible, but he was dead set on, after repairing hundreds of these situations, saying the paper tape is the way to go, and I would certainly recommend that here after a few strategic screws. Joe, what do you think on that? Yeah, regarding that, I agree that the fiberglass tape is nice because it sticks in place, but it's much harder to cover up, first of all, because it's much thicker and it's got bigger holes in it and they used to have perforated paper tape and i think they've pretty much done away with that because they realized just the solid paper tape is the best way to go but alan i had a question here. i'm looking at your photographs is this um is this on a wall that extends is it a narrow like a column or is this a wall flat wall that goes around a corner at it looks like a 45 degree angle or something like that is that what's that this i'm looking at it's going into a great room with a, a ceiling of almost 20 feet high so that's got to be a lot of movement right there and that's the only spot in that area that that's getting any type of movement thus i'm getting the crack okay well you could certainly replace the if there's a corner bead in there replace the corner bead put more if it's just tape then use tape there are a couple of products that seal cracks there's one called uh, i think it's ezr i'm not sure what that stands for but it's ezr hairline crack sealer and there's another one we've mentioned on air before called Goodbye Cracks that comes in a spray. It looks like spray paint, but it actually sprays a clear, thin rubber coating. And it's specifically made for stress cracks. Um, now, the last time I went to buy Goodbye Cracks, I don't know if they're just all bought up or they're hard to find or they're stuck on a freighter somewhere in the ocean, but they're it's pretty expensive. So um, I would try one of those products. Um, after, this is after you repair it, before you paint it. 
You put on you put on this sealer. Now, with the paper tape, you have to put down a, le- a level of mud and then put the tape on top of that. That is correct. Okay. Yep. And you squeeze out quite a bit of the mud after you put it down. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you know, I had heard that the paper was thinner than 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 the other. So uh, it is. I'll try and maybe four, four times. I'll, I'll finally fix it. <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I'm not sure this would work in your situation because I can't I can't see the whole wall. But I've often done. If there's a situation like that that I just can't seem to get the crack to, to disappear, I put a piece of, I take a nice piece of hardwood, and I just put it right over the whole end of the wall or wherever, you know, not, it has, it has to fit nicely and it has to look nicely. And you can always paint it if you want, but this way you just hide it behind a piece of wood and you don't ever see it again. If it cracks, it cracks. Okay, super. Well, again, I, I apologize for asking dumb questions, but, uh, after three times, I felt I, I had to go ask somebody smarter than I was. <laughs> Alan, there are no dumb questions. There might be some dumb answers. <laughs> Anytime you have any question at all, feel free to give us a call on that, and hopefully this will be the charm that will take care of it. And uh, we uh, hope you have a great new year and no more cracks in your future. All right. Take care, guys. Be well. <laughs> okay, Thank Alan. You. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week, and we'd love to hear your question. You can send us one at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This one comes from Carrie in Vermont. Hi, Danny. I know you have a lot of experience building paver patios, so I'm hoping you can help me out. My husband and I are planning a spring project laying a 20-foot long paver walkway that leads to a 12-foot paver patio. That sounds pretty nice. My question is about preparing the ground for the concrete pavers. My neighbor said we could just set the pavers over two inch thick bed of sand, but I'm afraid the sand won't support the pavers. When I heard we should use gravel with sand on top, now, we really want to only do this once and don't want the paver sinking into the sand. So what would you recommend? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Kerry, because it is a misconception a lot of times about simply using sand. But I must, you know, I have to say there's a lot of different types of coarseness of sand. There's some sand that's very coarse that packs very well. And then there's the very fine, fine sand that hardly packs at all. But what you really want to do is remove all of that vegetation in the area where you're putting down the pavers. Then you do want to put a crushed stone, not a round gravel because it won't pack well, but a crushed stone uh, that's available um, from Home Depot, uh, paved stone, has bags of it that's incredibly easy to work with. So you want to put that down, level it out, and then use a tamp to compact that. You'll be amazed at how hard that actually gets. Then is the time to put down three quarters inches of sand, just just a three quarter inch layer of sand that enables you to really get your pavers nice and level. Now that'll also pack fairly well when you're using that on top of the pavers. Then when you put the pavers in, you won't have any worry at all of it settling later on. Now you do want to dress it, top dress it with some sand to fill in all of the cracks that you have there. Then you'll have a patio and a walkway that'll last a long, long time. I would encourage you to go to pavestone.com and look at some of their um, how-to videos as well as many, many videos we have at todayshomeowner.com um, as well. Joe, you know, we've all seen those situations where people have gotten in a little bit of a hurry in putting those pavers down and maybe just put it right down on the ground, which ends up settling. And also the thing about it, that vegetation can grow up through those pavers a lot more when you just put it on ground, um, you know, in addition to the settling. Uh, whereas if you put that compacted crushed stone down, it's hard for those weeds to make it through that. Yeah, and the, the crushed stone Danny's talking about is often sold as, it's called paver base. So if you're at Home Depot looking around, sometimes you get confused because they're like, 40 different types of bags of gravel look like gravel they're not all the same so you're looking for a paver base and yeah the key is to come is the compaction it takes a lot of work especially if you're doing it by hand you can always rent a plate compactor but most people just do it by hand with a tamper um, but it's really important doing if you're going to put down like four inches put down one or two compact it put down another one or two and compact it because it's really hard to compact four inches you'll compact the top two inches but the bottom two inches won't compact as well and that's where the settling comes in um and then you can top it with that and i've also seen danny and have used there are some manufacturers make two types of paver base a slightly larger aggregate that you put down let's say two or three inches of you compact it then they have a separate paver base that's slightly finer gravel and you compact that, and then you end up with something that's almost like a concrete sidewalk. And when you compact all that, it really locks together. And what you want is you want it to be 
locked together so it supports the pavers, but then still allows water to drain through, obviously, because you don't want it to be a, you don't want it to be a muddy mess underneath there because that would affect how they support the pavers as well. You know, something we discovered that was kind of uh, interesting with the paver base, it's not all the same throughout the country. Because, you know, you think you think about something that's heavy like that, uh, they don't want to, you know, create something in California and, and ship it to Vermont. So there's, um, you know, the regional, there are different plants that create the paver base. A lot of it is through recycled material. So we've done projects out in Arizona and California and uh, Chicago, all over. And all the paver base is just a little different. Like some of it may be almost um, more of a red color, other very, very gray. So it's a, uh, it's kind of different when you, when you're buying it, you go, wait a minute, what is this? You know, and it's just uh, regionally though, it's uh, a little bit different like that. So that surprised me, but it still has the same uh, packable, um, you know, compaction properties that you really want in a situation like that. And the other tip is um, get a hose and spray a very light mist over. Yeah. Once you compact it a little bit, a little bit, spray it, and then compact it again, and what you're doing, you're washing down some of those little grains, and it really, anything you can do, because as Kerry mentioned, you don't want to lay the pavers and then have a problem, because there's no way to solve the problem without taking up all the pavers, and that's the last thing you want to do. So however long it takes, if it takes twice as long to set the base for the pavers, good for you. That's probably what you should be doing. You can pick up the phone anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Today's Homeowner Hotline is your way to get answers to your questions, give us any comment on things you would like for us to cover, or maybe share a tip with us that's worked well for you in and around your home. And you can reach out to us anytime, 800 946 4420. Right now we're going to Baltimore and Steve is on the line. Steve, welcome to the show and tell us what's going on, especially up in that attic. How are you guys doing? Hey, we're doing well. Thank you. Great. So, uh, yeah, so like you said, I live in Baltimore and I also live on the water, which complicates it a little more. Uh, we, we got some high winds and they're always blowing through. So I just recently went up into the attic because I am feeling, you know, drafts coming through the house no matter where I am. And it's uh, very frustrating. So I just haven't been up there in a while. And I went up there and took a look around. And after um, seeing a couple of the uh, videos that you guys had posted on on the website, which is awesome website and so much information on there. Thank you. I could just watch it forever. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I noticed that uh, – that the insulation was it was not up to par where it should have been the way that you were describing it in, in the uh, videos there. And there's two areas up there where the A-frame on the front of the house and the back of the house um, are. And um, I'm thinking that they should be sealed off because I never go up there and there's really nothing stored up there at this time. But um, above the back deck and above the front deck, there are areas where there's no insulation at all. I don't know if it's supposed to be that way or if it's not supposed to be that way. These areas where you don't have insulation, is that in the areas of the porches or is there a living area down below? No, there's no living area down below. It's directly above the deck where there's like the soffit above. Uh huh. Yeah, normally those areas would not be insulated. You'd um, have those, but the areas, you know, the vertical areas between there. But what you don't want to do is to close off anything that would hinder any of the cross ventilation through there. And, and as a general rule, any area that you have a living space below, you're going to need at least 14 inches of insulation, regardless of what type of insulation, whether it's a bat insulation or a blown insulation. Uh, we always reference it in inches instead of R value because it's just easier for most people to understand. So um, I would use a unfaced insulation in any of those areas above your living space and uh, go ahead and get, like I say, get you um, about 14, uh, 12 to 14 inches there and you'll immediately see a big difference. In looking at the um, the photos that you sent, uh, boy, there's not a lot of insulation in that attic, so you can certainly benefit from that. And really, like we always tell people, you'll get your money back on this home improvement investment probably quicker than just about any other way. Sure. Now, one quick question for you. So uh, before I saw your video um, on the website, I went to the local 
store here in Baltimore, and I bought several uh, rolls of the uh, face insulation. It's the R38, which is what's recommended for Maryland. Um, and I put that down. But in the areas that I put it down in, I kind of like pulled back the little bit of scattered insulation that was up there and put that down. Is is that like bad? Like, am I going to... Um, is that going to be bad for me, or should I take that up and put unfaced down? And the the craft paper is facing down towards the living space. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, you're fine there as long as you don't have insulation. You're just trying to keep there from being a moisture trap in there. So that's perfectly fine if the paper is faced down against the drywall or the plaster. Yep. You'll be perfectly fine. So um, I think that would be um, um, a great a great way to go. And uh, you should be in good shape. And another thing, too, um, Steve, you don't have to do all of this at one time. To do just a section at a time, uh, you'll, you'll be making a great step towards having a more energy-efficient home. Right. Okay, and those two areas um, where the A-frame, where it leads out to the A-frame, would it be okay to maybe put like one of those um, foam board um, pieces up there to like seal off the uh, the draft that would come in from underneath of the front and the back deck from coming into the center of the of the attic space? I actually wouldn't do that. I would leave all of that ventilation so that that fresh air can come in through those soffit areas and as long as you have a good place to exhaust out the top of the roof that's the most important so that you have that exchange but steve thanks so much for being with us best of luck on your insulation project i know it'll save you a lot of money you're listening to today's home on the radio we'll be right back You're listening to today's Homeowner Radio, the number one place for practical, realistic home improvement tips. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app. How doers get more done. And welcome back to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show. Danny Lippert here, along with my co-host Joe Truini. And it's time for our best new product segment, brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. You know, these days, it seems, people are more concerned than ever about the spread of germs, and with good reason. So it's important, more than ever, that we keep the surfaces we touch most often clean and free of germs. That's why the folks at Leviton developed their Decora Antimicrobial AC Quiet rocker light switch. The antimicrobial additive in the switch's surface inhibits 99% of bacterial growth, which when it's cleaned regularly. Now, that helps prevent the growth of harmful bacteria, mold, mildew, and fungi. Now, the switch can be used to replace any standard three-way switch and can be paired with their Decora antimicrobial wall plate, which is sold separately. So if you're interested in keeping the germs away from your home, you may want to check out this and the information on this particular light switch from Leviton, you can go to Home Depot.com. Again, Joe uh, Leviton's always out there right in the front right. with uh, all of the different um, products to make uh, things easier, the smart home devices, and now one to kind of uh, prevent the spread of germs. Well, they always say it's the touch surfaces, right, Danny, that spreads germs most. And I think we talked about this on air, but I read an article about what is the most germ filled thing in a hotel room? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think it's the toilet seat or the doorknobs. It's actually the Uh remote control. Oh, yeah. Because they don't. Now they're starting to. I notice when I go into a hotel, they're actually, it's sealed in a plastic bag. That's right. I noticed that too here recently. I guess they changed the bag. You're supposed to use it through the bag, and I guess they changed the bags. Right, Um, yeah. But yeah, anything they can do to cut down the uh, amount of bacteria in a house is is, is a move forward, a step forward. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Hey, let's get right back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline. And you can join us on the hotline by calling us at 800 946 4420. Wanda's on the line now from New York. Wanda, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house. Well, hi. It's so nice to talk to you. I watch your show all the time and listen to your radio podcast. Great. You're awesome. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for that. We hope we don't let you down on this call. <laughs> oh, me too. Wanda, that's my job to tell Danny he's awesome. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> well, my, my problem, it's not really a problem yet, but uh, I have a modular home 
and it was manufactured in September 26, 1980. It's a basic ranch-type house. I have a full basement, and as you know, modulars come in two pieces. Right. And they're super big beams that go across to hold the two pieces together. But what I want to do is open up the kitchen into the living room. So I don't know if it's safe to do that. Um, Any advice? Okay. Well, I'll tell you, it's a little more of a unique situation when you're talking about a modular home because, as you mentioned, there's two separate uh, pieces to the home that are put together, and certainly the spans and the beams that are there uh, all have a very, very critical role in supporting everything. Now, you know, I have a lot of people that ask me, you know, can this wall be removed or this wall? I, I pretty much tell you any wall in a home can be removed, some a little more expensive than others. Uh, But what I would really recommend is to get, um, first of all, I would call um, a local um, manufacturer or somebody that manufactures these homes and just maybe ask them, do you know someone that specializes in modification of these homes? Because they would have the better knowledge as far as exactly um, how they're put together, how they're built, and how you can actually span that area where that wall is. Now, it might be that that wall between the two areas that you're wanting to take out is not load-bearing. It could be that it's a very simple thing to take that out, but I would really call in either a structural engineer that um, routinely works um, with contractors on this type of project, um, or try to find through the manufacturer maybe someone uh, that um, can advise you on that, but uh, I'll bet it can be taken out. Okay. Well, it is the center wall between the two um, sides, so it's not like a a wall that's on one side that came down the road. It's the Mm -hmm. center one. I see. I see. Well, it's it's possible that it's very load bearing, and um, someone that and now do you have access to the attic space above this area? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. Well, that's 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 that will tell everything once um, that educated eye gets there and looks at it. Then they'll be able to tell you. Now, it may need uh, an additional beam that's put in in order to handle that. And I'll tell you something that a lot of people do, Wanda, is is they'll put a beam under the ceiling um, instead of what we call a flush beam. You know, many times you can put a beam in the attic space and you don't even see it down below and then you can just add the piece of drywall that's necessary to combine those two ceiling areas. That's really the best way to do it and the vast majority of the time you do have that option to do that. So if someone says we'll have to put a beam below uh, the ceiling line, question them and see if that can be a flush beam instead it might be a slight bit more expensive, but it certainly looks a lot more original when you do it that way, and it gives you that more of that open feeling that you're really looking for. Okay. I've seen that online before, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Well, best of luck on that. We certainly appreciate all the kind words about watching the show and our listening to everything, and uh, we hope that we can help you again. You know how to get in touch with us. Well, thank you so much for getting back to me. Okay. Our pleasure, Wanda, and uh, hope you have a great New Year's. Thank you. You too. Hey, if you're listening to us for the first time, get ready. This is one of everybody's favorite parts of the show when Joe Truini, my capable co-host, shares with us another simple solution. Okay, Joe, I, I teed it up for you. What do you have? Yeah, thank you, Danny. If you decorated your house with a live Christmas tree this year, what do you do with it at the end of the holidays? Well, rather than just dragging it to the curb, you can rent the chipper shredder And you can share this cost with neighbors, by the way. You get a chipper shredder and you shred the tree into mulch. And then you can use it to spread around gardens and flower beds. And in some towns, they even, the town will collect the trees and shred it up and there'll be a big mountain of mulch and the town people can just go and get it for free. But um, if you don't have that service in your town, rent one of these shredders. They're pretty affordable. And Danny, I know you had a live Christmas tree and you have a more creative use for a Christmas tree at the end of the holidays. Absolutely. I'm actually going to place my tree um, um, later on today uh, underneath my boat dock. Okay. And uh, I have five or six other trees there right now, and it's a proven way, a great habitat for smaller fish that draws in the bigger fish. Right. So that when you come down, we'll be able to catch dinner down here. So. <laughs> I have to catch you dinner? Okay. That's a, that's a good deal, though. I'm always willing to fish, even if I have to give the fish away. Uh, yeah, Danny and I have been on <laughs> many fishing expeditions, and we, we can't wait to go fishing again. Um, now, as you 
you put these trees in, do you find that they eventually decompose? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the water receded a good bit recently. It does that a lot during the winter. Mm -hmm. And notice that uh, it still has, you know, it, you know, all, all of uh, most everything's off of the the limbs. But still, you have the limbs, and right. you have there. And of course, you have to weight these things down. Oh, of course, yeah. Especially if they're pretty dry. So you know, I use some leftover bricks and blocks. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is a very acceptable way to create this fish habitat. And uh, I put them directly under the walkways so that you're not so prone to get, you know, hooked on them when, yeah, you're, hung when up. you're fishing. Right. Yeah. So uh, it works out pretty well, to, and the fish absolutely love it. Now, hey, I want to encourage everybody to check out some of Joe's other simple solutions on the website. There's over 500 of them there at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. Like some of these, like uh, building a boot cleaner to keep your boots clean. It's a real innovative way that Joe came up with that can be right outside your door, especially if you're in a you know a snow prone area to get all of that wet snow off your feet. So really great. When also very important this time of the year, how to prevent some slips and falls on some of the outside steps. Very simple way of taking care of that. So again, today's homeowner.com slash simple solutions. Go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, and as Danny mentioned at the very beginning of the show, these simple solutions, often I'll make them up or, I, or Danny will share some with me. You know, and if you're working around your house and you're, you've come up with a tip on your own or someone's shared a tip with you, share it with us and we'll spread it across the uh, airwaves here at the Today's Homeowner Radio. It's very easy. You can give us a call anytime on the Today's Homeowner Hotline, 800-946-4420. Send us an email, todayshomeowner.com slash ask. We want to help as many people as we can during this hour of today's homeowner radio so we're going to jump right in to a couple calls we got on the today's homeowner hotline this week my name is david and my problem is uh, opening up my refrigerator it's like the door is really really sticking the 10 year old doesn't have the strength and uh, any help you could give me on uh, how to fix this i'd appreciate it Boy, you know, I've seen that more and more recently here yes, where, yeah. you know, old refrigerators, new refrigerators. Of course, during this time of the year, a lot of people probably would uh, encourage uh, a harder way of getting in the refrigerator, if you know what I mean. Because uh, <laughs> exactly. a, lot of, a lot of people are saying, you know, lock that thing up. I actually saw something on Facebook recently where someone, you know, jokingly had a, a chain all the way around <laughs> it and, and, and you know, out. think before you unlock, you right, know, so that's right. maybe that's a little extreme. But, you know. I guess, Joe, you know, uh, with the magnets that you have with the doors that hold it together could be the problem. But also a lot of times uh, if it's sealed properly, you're talking about quite a vacuum that you have to break in order to open that door. Yeah, that's exactly right. The reason this occurs so often, especially on larger refrigerators, it seems, is that when you open the door, some of the cold air, of course, flows out, but also some of the warm, humid humid air from the house flows in. Mm -hmm. And when you close the door, it seals really tightly, which is good because it keeps the food cold, but that creates the vacuum, and that makes it really hard to open. And this is particularly a problem if... Um, you know, if you try to do it immediately, sometimes over time, you know, it'll some of the, the vacuum will leak out. But um, so what do you do about it? Right. That's the question. So um, sometimes if the gaskets are dirty, you can just try cleaning them. Um, we heard that GE recommends putting paraffin wax on the gasket. Sometimes that can help. But uh, yeah, if it's the magnets themselves, which are just too strong. Um, I think, Dan, you had the idea of putting some kind of tape or something just to... Yeah, I've, I've heard of that. It's not on the you know? whole gasket, at least on enough that maybe you're weakening yeah. that seal from the magnets. Right. I mean, it's worth a try. You know, you can use white uh, tape if it's a white gasket so that it doesn't stand right. out. And just carefully cut it the width of the uh, seal and then just apply it just to see if it kind of loosens it up a little bit. You don't want it to leak, of course, but if you right. can kind of um, lessen the pull a little bit so that everybody can can get in and out of there. I've also seen some, uh, especially on the freezer part, that would have just a little latch, that'll just a little release that you actually could push. And I thought that was real convenient. Is basically you're just putting your hand on it, and your thumb releases it, and makes it, uh, you know, out. Because you think about, of course, um, uh, David on the call there mentioned a ten year old, but you also think about the elderly and how frustrating that must be yes. if they're, you know, maybe a little weaker than they have been in past years to. Try try to get in and out of a refrigerator or a freezer, um, that could be extremely frustrating. Yeah, if you think back to the old days, there used to be a handle that when you pulled it, it would be like a latch and it mm -hmm. would unlock. Mm -hmm. um, I think that just came from the industrial coolers that they have in kitchens, which still have that kind of, you, know, you pull on the handle, it just 
it has like a cam action that pops the door open. And maybe we need to go back to that because I know some friends that have bought these really large, expensive sub zeros and they can't get in them. You know, right. So they look mm-hmm. great because they're losing weight. But other than that, they can't get into the darn refrigerator. There's no 10-year-old around. So I guess um, they can try some of these tips here that we share, and hopefully it'll make the door a little easier to open. But I can see my grandson right now. If he wanted to get in there, he would jump up on that refrigerator <laughs> like a ninja, place those two feet firmly on the surface, and pull with all his might. But he would get in there some somehow. But that would uh, that's not what you want. So, so David, no. just you might try that with a paraffin wax as one. Uh, petroleum jelly is also something else that you can uh, put around the perimeter there and give that a try. And then the tape trick I, I was mentioning, uh, between one of those, hopefully, it'll make it a little easier to get in and out of that refrigerator. Let's go back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline for another call. Yeah, this is uh, Paul Curtis. My problem was got these uh, hardwood floors, and there's certain sections of them that have been eaten with uh, termites, and I'd like to replace just those sections without replacing the whole floor, and I uh, wondering if I could do that or not. Okay. Well, you certainly can, but boy, you got to get rid of those termites. Uh, so if you don't have a bond on the house, that would be number one before you did any repair or tried to do anything. And, you know, a termite company, um, they, they approach them in many different ways. A lot of them will, if you have no bond on it, they'll many times will trench around all of the piers and the perimeter uh, curtain wall and then inject poison around there. A lot of times they'll do uh, drilling here and there to inject poison in it and and uh, boy I mean they are a destructive insect so you really have to throw everything at them to kill them that's number one of course Paul to do that um, then um, Joe the challenge of course you know is uh, a lot of times is finding the wood that will match and right. you're certainly not going to find the wood that will match in terms of the stain so and blending in stain on an existing hardwood floor um, that's just like magic you just it's just hard yeah. to achieve yeah, well, if Paul's lucky, he hasn't mentioned he has unfinished, not unfinished, but unstained, just naturally finished hardwood floor where it's just um, plain wood that's about polyurethane. And Paul doesn't mention whether he's on a slab or on a, uh, a plywood subfloor, but if it's a plywood subfloor, I'd be really surprised if there wasn't termite damage in the subfloor of as well. Course, so yeah. he's mm-hmm. going to have to pull up whatever damage. If his question is, can he replace just individual boards? Absolutely. And it's not the easiest thing to do, but you can replace the boards without damaging the boards that have not been eaten by termites. So, yeah, he's going to have to cut out those boards. And it's a little hard to explain on the radio how to do that. But there is a way to drill holes into the boards, um, run a circular saw around, and basically you're taking out like the center of the board. You cut from hole to hole. So you pull out the center of the board and you're leaving the the edges which are tongue and groove and then with a hammer and chisel you can chop those out because now the center of the board is missing um, so you can do that and once you get all those boards out then you can put in the the get new boards and patch it but again the challenge would be matching that stain if it is stained exactly but i'd, I'd be surprised if he pulls up those boards and finds that the termites are only eating the flooring yeah yeah and not whatever other wood is nearby yeah, hopefully that's very isolated to just that that one area. So best of luck on that, Paul. But get those termites killed before you try any repairs. Right now we're going to the beautiful state of Kentucky, and Joe is on the line right now. Joe, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on with this deck out behind your house. Yeah, hi. Uh, I watched your show a couple of weeks ago. When me and my wife both enjoy watching your show Sunday morning. Oh, good. Thank you. But uh, it said we could email you a, a question about maybe some of the problems we, we have, and uh, we moved uh, to a, a new single wire back in 2009, and I built a couple of decks, one on the back and one on the front, and uh, screwing down the deck boards, I used a certain material, and uh, in time, it just uh, kind of popped up, and the screws got rusty. I could see the, the rust coming through the caulking that I used, and I switched to a different product. I use several different products. I use wood putty and water putty and uh, a product called Quad. And they they work for a while, but then they seem to uh, expand and contract at a different ratio than the wood. And I always have to replace it. So I'm wondering if there's a material that is best to use for that kind of a condition. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's amazing the expansion and contraction that takes place on any kind of material, but particularly a wood deck. And you're right, it expands and contracts at at kind of different ratios. And uh, it's funny how it can basically 
unscrew a screw sometimes it's you know why don't it why, do, why doesn't it make the screw tighter but it is sometimes it'll <laughs> it'll back it right out of there and anything that you have on top of it joe what do you think on this you know one of the uh, tricks that we use recently is to basically create some sawdust right uh, from the same material and then we used um the you know the um, ultimate three tight bond exterior glue that's waterproof and uh we use this on some wood shutters and boy it worked really well do you think that would work on uh, the deck boards that joe's working with yeah joe the problem is as you identified there's so much movement in that wood now these screw heads are counter sunk or counter board do you know the difference between are they set almost flush with the surface or are they counter board meaning down below the surface you know quarter inch three eighths of an inch something like that they're not that far down below the surface, I guess okay. they're just uh, maybe an eighth of an inch or so. Yeah, so they're countersunk, yeah. The reason I was asking, if they're counterboard, if you drilled a hole and drove in the screw, then you could fill it actually with a wood plug. But in this case, yeah, the, the reason you don't often see decks with the screw heads covered with any kind of caulk or putty is for the exact reason you discovered, is that there's nothing, there's not enough surface there to fill it. You know, because the the screw heads aren't deep enough to accept very much putty or filler or anything else. So um, I'm not sure you'd find anything that's successful. I mean, the thing that would hold best would be an epoxy. But even that, because it dries really hard. Um, but even that, with the expansion and, and the contraction of the wood, um, I'm not sure if those wouldn't just pop right out eventually. But there's one way to find out. Get a little epoxy and patch two or three holes, then wait. Maybe I might have to wait a whole season but and see what happens. Uh, so that's about the only, like I said, unless the screw heads are screw heads are counterboard below the surface a good amount, meaning at least quarter inch to three eighths of an inch, which you can then plug with wood. There's not much else you can do to cover those holes. Well, what about what uh, Danny said about mixing uh, some of that type on carpenter's glue with uh, sawdust? That would dry hard as well, so that might work. I'm not sure what it'd look like. But usually that's for a smaller repair that you sand and then paint or finish somehow. Uh, is this a stain deck? Uh, it's got uh, a solid stain. Okay, well, the stain would it would accept the stain because it's partly wood, so it might blend in. I'll give that a try. I, I appreciate your help. All right, Joe. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Tell your wife we said hello, and we appreciate you watching our television show. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right. If we can help you again, just let us know. That's great. Hey, let's get an email here, Joe. I wanted to read All this right. one from Kelly. And again, we'd remind you, if you'd like to send us an email, we'd love to get it from you. And you can send it to todayshomeowner.com slash ask. We just had a new concrete driveway poured that was tinted with a dark gray colorant. I do not like the color, which is just way too dark. Is there any way to get rid of the colorant? Oh, boy. Uh, boy. Um, I'm not sure what we could do there. First of all, nature's going to help you a lot there. Mother Nature's going to lighten up that concrete as it uh, gets some rain or snow or whatever. Little by little, it will lighten it up considerably. So you might just want to kind of wait a little bit on that. But other than that, Joe, um, that's that's a tough one. You, you know, a lot of times in situations you can make things darker, but it's really hard to make them lighter without basically painting them, and we never recommend painting concrete. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. We often get listeners who want to darken a concrete, but in this case, Kelly wants to lighten it. They do make a product it's called a color release liquid and also comes in a powder form that you make into a liquid and the color release liquid is specifically designed for lightening concrete um should have to go to an, a, a concrete um industrial warehouse of some sort to find it or uh, you can probably buy it online like everything else um so she could try that get a small amount get the smallest amount you can buy and try it in an area maybe in an inconspicuous part mm -hmm. and see if that works yeah because it does release the color it's just a matter of, is it going to release it enough and the other thing i don't know is if you do it and it release and it releases some of the color and it's lighter but still a little too dark can you then go over it again it continues to get lighter i mean i don't right, know right yeah um but kelly could check with the manufacturer but that that'd be the only option i think is the color release liquid yeah yeah and again i would give it a few months there and see what mother nature does to it hey here's one we want to share with you that we get a lot of comments about this came in from kathy in pennsylvania another email said hi danny and joe i would love for you to repeat the recipe for your wallpaper stripper i know it contains some type of concentrated wallpaper remover but i didn't catch the name well i want to give you this uh, formula but also encourage you to go to todayshomeowner.com click on our view button it'll take you right to the 
the radio page that'll tell you this exact recipe and share with you a lot of the things that we're talking about on this week's show. Again, it's todayshomeowner.com. Click on the view button or the listen button. I'm, I meant to say the listen button or the radio button. So anyway, here's what you do if you really want to take that wallpaper off and make it very, very easy. You use a five-gallon bucket. You put three gallons of the hottest water you can get in it. Then the DIF, D-I-F, wallpaper remover concentrate, 22 ounces of that goes in the bucket, a quarter cup of liquid fabric softener, a cup of white vinegar, and two tablespoons of baking soda. Again, you can get get this on our website. Now, I guarantee you this works very, very well. You mix all of this up. You use one of the 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 wallpaper, what they call a paper tiger, to perforate the the surface of the wallpaper. And then you get a pump up sprayer. Keep this stuff mixed up well, and just saturate the walls with this uh, solution. And then the real trick that I found is to take some lightweight plastic and just lay it on the wall the moisture will hold it you don't have to tape it or anything and it just basically works on that glue to release that wallpaper no matter how many layers you have it's amazing how easy this works and you may want to do this let's say you have a weekend project and you do mix this solution do everything that you need to put the solution on there put your plastic on and let it sit overnight. Then get up on Saturday morning and your project will go a lot smoother than you might think. Then you'll want it to dry sufficiently. You can accelerate that with a little bit of a fan action on it before you repair any little damage that you might have from scraping it off. But that's how easy it is. And again, you can find this by going to todayshomeowner.com slash listen and be able to get this formula together. Guarantee it works really, really well. Now, are you thinking of doing some renovation here in the new year and you're thinking, well, maybe I can do some of it myself? We'll give, we'll give you some guidelines, some things you need to think about before you grab that sledgehammer right here on today's Home on a Radio. Call today's homeowner radio anytime, 800-946-4420. Danny and Joe will be right back. Chelsea here. When I'm not on today's homeowner TV or radio shows, I'm sharing projects, how-to DIY tips, and other home inspiration over on my blog at checkingwithchelsea.com. Be sure to stop by, sign up for my newsletter, and watch my latest episode to get home improvement information with a Chelsea twist. I don't spare any details, so you'll know how to take a project from zero to completion and hopefully enjoy the process. See you soon over at checkingitwithchelsea.com. Each year, loose or damaged electrical wires cause more than 50,000 home fires in the U.S. Protect your home with an arc fault circuit interrupter or AFCI outlet. Arc faults can occur anywhere in your home's electrical system and often go unseen. They can be caused by loose connections or appliance wires that have been crimped by furniture. AFCI outlets are designed to detect wiring problems and shut off the circuit when it senses an electrical arc, helping to prevent a home fire. Learn more at leviton.com AFCI. A lot of ways you can get in touch with us. Sending emails is an easy one. Today is homeowner.com slash ask or just picking up the phone and giving us a ring at 800 946 4420. Also, want to remind you that you can reach out to us also through Facebook. Go to the Today's Homeowner Facebook page. You'll be surprised all the information you see there. There's things, new information being put up each and every day, and I'm sure there'll be some things that you can certainly use around your house. Right now, we're going to go back to the Today's Homeowner hotline, headed to Georgia to talk to Roseanne. Roseanne, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house there. Hi. I am in the process of renovating my home, and the question that I had was whether or not I should um, hire maybe a contractor to help me with all the work that I need done, or should I source out each each job separately? So I have a lot to get done. I'd like to upgrade my kitchen, bathrooms, change out flooring, carpeting, maybe look at a new overall layout for the kitchen and bathroom. But I'm unsure which way to go. So I was really hoping that you guys could lend me some assistance in what's the advantage versus the disadvantages of trying to um, source it all myself or just hiring someone to oversee the entire project for my home. Well, I'll tell you, Roseanne, that's a, that's a great question and one that a lot of people 
ponder because um, a lot of people will feel like they can um, really save some a su- substantial amount of money by you know being their own contractor. And you know if you're really well versed in construction, and the most important is you have the right contacts, and that's usually where it's really tough for a homeowner because it's just not as easy as picking up the phone, calling three people, having three meetings, getting the best price, calling them, and they go to work. There's so many people that do not show up. There's so many situations where um, maybe a contractor or a subcontractor that you speak with does a lot of work for contractors. Well, they're going to get their calls answered before a homeowner, unfortunately. That's not fair, but that is the reality of it. So a lot of times it's very hard unless you really have some good resources to find that right drywall man, that right painter, then it can be the biggest, the most frustrating thing that you've ever dealt with. So a lot of times what I'll recommend people do is to find that good remodeling contractor that you can really communicate with very well then have them take care of the bulk of the work, but then look at different parts of the job that you can do yourself uh, without overextending yourself. Um, Maybe removing, um, doing some of the demolition, or uh, certainly buying as much of the materials as you can and having them there on the project when the contractor need, needs that. Um, a lot of contractors appreciate not having to you know, coordinate the vanity and the, um, the bathroom fixtures and those type of things. Um, you know, and you can talk with them, you know, what can I take off your plate and allow me to save a little bit of money. Um, so there, I, I think, you know, in kind of a short answer to that, um, I would uh, call your Home Builders Association and ask them for some recommendations on remodeling contractors. Um, also ask some of your friends that have had projects done recently. And, you know, do you have someone that's really worked well with you? And I think that way you still can move the project along. You still can save some money. You can still be involved in it and get the gratification that comes along with that without completely swallowing up all of your time and creating a frustrating experience. Does that make sense? It totally does, yeah. And I think the biggest concern for me was trying to plan the timing of each project. So do I paint? Do I do floors first? Like which order, which sequence does everything go in? But yeah, that totally makes sense. I I think that's the way to go. That is a concern, what we call the critical path, because you can get one contractor in front of the other, and a lot of times, you know, in scheduling that out, you you know, you have the electrician, he maybe shows up a day late, once he finishes, then you've got to get the next subcontractor in, and that might be another week before they can get to you, or maybe two weeks before they get to you. And that's where I also hear a lot of frustration with people, um, just the project taking so long because of so many schedules you're having to mesh. And that's where a remodeling contractor that does it every single day can handle a lot of that and have a little more pull in getting the the guys to kind of stack them up a little bit more and to keep it going in the right direction. So, uh, Hope we've been able to help you with that. If you have any other questions as you go along there, uh, don't hesitate to reach back out to us. Will do. Thank you so much for your help. I appreciate it. Okay, our pleasure. And you have a great new year. You know, Joe, that that is something that, you know, you hear. We've heard it all along about, um, you know, the frustrations that people have. And, and, you know, you want to do as much as you can. Not uh, some people. It's not just a matter of trying to save money, but it's also that scenario of, hey, I really want to be involved in this. I really right. want to put my handprint on that wall and so forth. But uh, boy, you got to be careful, or you can really get into a mess. Right. And with Roseanne wanting to do so much on her home, like almost remodel, she sent us photographs of the inside and outside. And there's a lot of projects. I think you're right. It's much better to get a general contractor in there to run the interference for you and get everybody get the the subs in and out if it's one project though like like if she she just want to redo a bathroom or just to redo her kitchen and does a lot of research she could do i would have recommended her you know you can save some money and you can meet some good trade find some good trades people you can probably manage that as the general contractor for one project but to have several projects going on at once that would be overwhelming, I think. So, um, 
So that, that, that would be my advice to Roseanne. If he's doing, trying to do all these projects, get in a general contractor. Royce from Virginia writes in, I've noticed some drafts coming from the windows in my house. I know the solution should be to seal the gaps around them on the outside, but my windows and siding are vinyl, and all the caulk I'm seeing is white, gray, beige, or brown, none of which match my siding. Should I just try to paint the caulk with a matching paint? Well, Royce, that's what you used to have to do, but um, not so much anymore. Um, you know, that uh, problem could get pretty tedious when you have those type of materials and you put the caulk on and then you have to touch it up. Uh, I think I have a better solution for you because we, we talk a lot about tight bond and the Weathermaster sealant is really available in over 200 colors that'll match any of the popular siding colors. So no painting is necessary. And what's more important is that it is a polymer formula that's designed to provide the best performance on siding, windows, doors, or any of the vents that you might have around your house. And, you know, latex caulk will become hard and brittle over a certain amount of time, but Weathermaster has permanent flexibility, so it'll move with the materials as it expands and contracts, and it does a really good job adhering to wood, masonry, PVC, uh, fiber cement siding, which is so popular, as well as the vinyl siding that you mentioned that you had on your house, and it'll fill gaps up to one inch wide. Now, that might sound unusual, but we see this all the time with settling of homes and so forth, and it does have UV resistance. So, plus, uh, winter's already here. It's handy that you can apply it in extreme weather conditions as well. So, you don't have to wait until spring to stop all of those drafts. And um, you can check it out at tightbond.com. Dot com. Great, great material. We've used that a lot, and uh, it does work very, very well. And it's also nice to know when you use Type Bond Weathermaster, you're done. You won't have to do that again anytime soon. Here's another email from Bill in Little Rock, Arkansas. Hi, Danny and Joe. I've got a beautiful hardwood log that measures 20 inches in diameter by 20 feet long. Boy, that sounds wow. that sounds neat. Um, I'm planning to cut it up into planks, but can you tell me how to figure out how many board feet of lumber is in that log? Okay, mathematician Joe, um, <laughs> I, I'll let you take this one here. Um, I knew, you know, um, through the years and figuring out board feet and that kind of thing, I never really understood why you needed to do that unless you were, you know, in the lumber business and so forth, because I'd always... Right you know, think of dimensional lumber in a different way. But what would you tell Bill? And I really question why he would ask that unless that's what how the sawmill that is going to get it cut into planks right. charges for that. Maybe that's what it is. But uh, do you have a math formula for Bill? Yeah, there actually is a relatively simple math formula. And and why they use board foot measurements, I'm not really sure, except just the way mills typically do it. And for anyone who's not familiar, a single board foot of lumber measures one inch thick, by 12 inches wide, by 12 inches long. So if you imagine a piece of wood 12 by 12, just one inch, th that's a single board foot. So the formula is you multiply the width by the length by the thickness and then divide by 12. So in this case, well, and plus, now this is a round log, so it makes it a little more difficult. So what Bill would have to do is draw a square on the end of the log, the biggest square he could. So let's say it ends up being like 18 inches square. And then do that math. Do that math. So it would be 18 times 18, because it'd be 18 inches square, and then 20 foot long. So 18 by 18 by 20, which, and then divide by 12, and it comes out to like 540 or 550 square feet, something like that. Not feet, square feet, board feet. So that's what we'd have about 540 or 50 board feet wow. out of a log, out of a beam that's like 18 by 18 by 20 feet long. So wow. that, that's basically the the formula. Um, yeah. And you're right. Somebody's probably going to ask them, how many board feet am I going to get out of this and how much is it going to cost me? So right. mm -hmm. that, that's how you do it. Well, you know, if you recall, it, I haven't had a chance to show you this pile of sawmill lumber that I have. But, you know, when I built my house, there was this very large cedar tree that right. ha had some disease in it. It wasn't in good shape. It wasn't very pretty. But I wanted to make sure that I use that because nothing like fresh sawn 
cedar. And so that was uh, about two years ago that I cut it down. Oh. I have it stored inside, right. and this wood is absolutely beautiful. And I have most of it cut in one-inch thicknesses, which is standard, because once you plane it down, you end up with a right. three-quarter inch dimension. But uh, yeah, next time you're down, I'll have to mm. I'll have to show you that, because uh, it is beautiful. And I'm, I don't know what I'm going to build out of it. Everybody right. keeps saying, what are you going to build out of it? But uh, I'm going to build something sooner or later. Oh, but good. Hopefully yeah. pretty soon. Tell us about the Simple Solution coming up, Joe. Sure. How to steam clean your microwave oven. Might be a bit messy after the holidays. Absolutely. I'll, I'll have to listen to that because uh, I shouldn't have cooked that chili for quite so long. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe put a top on it. I'll, a chili I'll, volcano I'll... you created. I've seen that before. <laughs> Here's an easy way to clean the inside of your microwave oven. You pour a 50-50 solution of water and white vinegar into a glass bowl. Set the bowl in the oven. Turn the microwave on high for... Well, depending on the size of the oven and the size of the mess, I guess at least four or five minutes. And then you know, when it goes off, be really careful removing that bowl because it's going to be super hot, of course. So remove the bowl, then scrub the inside of the oven with a scouring sponge. In fact, you can actually take the scouring sponge and dip it into the liquid that was in the bowl. Just again, be careful, it's really hot, and scrub the inside. And what happens is all that steam created by the water and the vinegar will loosen up and soften any of that stubborn caked on stain, which is why it comes off pretty easily. Uh, so that's the tip. And then you want to dry it really well. And by the way, this is another tip that I did very recently. My wife had microwaved something and it wasn't dirty, but it just had an odor left over from, I forgot what it was that she had microwaved previously. And so I put a bowl of diluted lemon juice in there. And again, it's 50-50 water and lemon juice. And I just used the bottle lemon juice, not fresh lemon juice. And turn that on for a couple of minutes and you pull that out and the whole thing smelled completely clean, deodorized just from the, the, the steam of the lemon the diluted lemon juice so there are two tips two tips for one well let's throw in a third one there joe why don't we okay keep danny away from your microwave that's the other during, during the the holidays and that garbage disposal might be right. a little funky right now exactly. and um there's nothing more fun than taking a <laughs> cup of uh, vinegar uh, white vinegar of course and then uh, i forgot how much baking soda you recommend on oh that. half a cup or so yeah half a cup of baking soda and i guess you put the baking soda in the uh, First. garbage disposal first and then you pour the vinegar in which creates a very nice volcano effect it's cool it's actually and pretty cool and then right? it completely cleanses and you can tell you can hear it in there cleansing yeah. all of those parts in there so that's another one there you go three for one simple solution here on today's homeowner and you can find a lot more over 500 of them online right now todayshomeowner.com slash simple solution does that mean i get the next two weeks off because you've given three no you need to come back with four next week <laughs> oh is that how it works so we want to keep raising the bar. That's right. We'll, okay. we'll do a whole show of Simple Solutions. I Let's think that, that would be someday. a lot of fun at some point. Hey, thanks so much for being with us on this Today's Homeowner podcast. And we appreciate all those wonderful reviews we continue to get each and every week. We appreciate that. And again, if you'd like to reach out to us uh, to make any comment or ask a question, it's as easy as going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. I'm Danny Lippert along with Joe Truini. Thanks so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner podcast.